speaking in all the slokas and sutras of the revealed scriptures. Without her, O oh shining ones, all the worlds would be like clouds with no rain. She is the perfect eye consciousness existing in all the multitude of words. And the secret of all the mantras, whose very being is the essence of non-duality. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Haryom 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 Tatsat. And we welcome you to this class on the New Year's after Kalpataru Day has passed and just prior to that Holy Mother's birthday and Christmas. So it's a very auspicious time. Sarva Mangala Mangalie. It's one of the most auspicious times of auspicious times in the year. And we want to present a class to you today that's just an hour long. Instead of the usual three hour offering on Sunday, we decided to start the new year out with a new precedent and begin to give people a little smaller bites, Brahmin bites, if you want to call them that, that um, are able to be viewed on a busy week or even a busy weekend these, these days in our lives easily and quickly and, and uh, then later to be taken into deep contemplation and and uh, realized these profound truths of Indian Dharma. So the subject being mantra and how it destroys karma. So it's a very profound subject <coughs> and you could say probably about it as an introduction all around the world, hour to hour, day to day, year upon year, beings are repeating and reciting these sacred formulas consisting of words. They're called mantras, sometimes slokas, sutras, suras. They're also called mahavakyas, great sayings. So from Aham Brahmasmi to Allahu Akbar to Om Namah Shivaya, to Jai Sri Ramakrishna, to Hail Mary, full of grace, to Om Tari Tut Tari Turi Swaha. Various traditions of the world have these profound collections of words, which we call mantras. And, and then they're stored up in scriptures in terms of collections of slokas and sutras, like the Yoga Sutras and the slokas of the Upanishads. So these are being emanated out from inside, from the storehouse of Shakti power. It all comes from Shakti, so we want to look at that, at her, as I started chanting this morning, really as the original source and the primal cause of all of this wisdom transmission that's going on that some people in the world are fortunate enough to pick up on. Others lagging behind maybe still have to learn that she's the secret in not just all the mantras, as I just chanted, but in every word. She's the inner meaning, she's the outer meaning, she's the thing being inferred like an object or a particular teaching or a particular truth. And she's the one that then, when brought forth, especially consciously, will destroy karmas of different kinds. I mean, by karmas here, we're talking about evil, uh, bad, mixed karmas are also responsible for a lot of problems. So all of this will dest destroy, if not destroy, diminish the effects of actions done, activities done by people who are, as Krishna says in the Gita, doing this in a tamasic or a rajasic state of mind. You want to make sure all actions that you do or undertake, this would start with thought, because thought is father to the deed. 
thought and then it trickles down and out towards your uh, thinking process and into actions and then right on down to the objects which are also made of particles of thought or intelligence and in a solidified form that we do all of this in at least a, a very balanced state of mind uh, so that um, thought word and deed come true. Sri Ramakrishna used to say elephant's tusks come out of its head but they should never turn and go back in. So there are cases where the test tusk will begin to curve and grow back, grow back into the penetrate the jawbone of the elephant and keep growing, pushing inside, causing great pain. We know that as a mad elephant or a rogue elephant. <clears throat> so if you use that analogy in terms of a man's words, he's meaning that the words that come out should be true and should be right and should hopefully be even dharmic or uh, immersed, ingrained with that jnana wisdom. We call it atma jnana in our tradition. So that everything that's said, even if you have to come and use the mundane level of words, everyday words with people in your life, that there will be that hidden presence of shakti power underneath everything you say and behind everything that you do. This is one way to how to become conscious of consciousness or aware of awareness. So in a one hour class, I'm also attempting here to keep my preambles to these subjects shorter and um, the charts will be less because we want to show just specific charts that fit inside of this hour offering, which we can render quickly and put up on our sites that we use and our wisdom websites and some on YouTube and so forth that you can look into. So we will be able to put out a series of these, in this case, a three-part class this Sunday, next Sunday, and the following class on mantra and how it destroys karmas. I had been giving it some thought as to how to make a, a chart that was illustrative of a power actually coming out from inside and penetrating all levels of consciousness and destroying these karmas. You say, well, um, where are karmas stored in the mind? How do they get formed you know, by desires and, and activities of different kinds? And uh, where do they come from? How, how do they get alleviated through nadis? You could say, well, go to your guru and say, well, I have karmas in my nadis. I think if he knows anything, or she knows anything, they'll be aware of what you're saying. I have karmas in my nadis. So he'll ask you, where? What nadis? Your physical nadis? Nadis are nerves, by the way, or carriers of energy. Are they in your physical nadis? Are they in your emotional nadis, which for a lot of people nowadays they are? Are they in your psychological nadis, uh, your thinking process? Are they in your philosophical nadis, because Father of Yoga talked about those two as Bronte Darshana, things that impede people's higher understanding of philosophical truths, which should just be accepted outright, don't need to be argued or questioned. Or maybe they're in your spiritual nadis, like those blockages, grantis they're called, or knots, in your way of thinking that keep you from attaining enlightenment, keep pushing you back one step forward, two steps back, is the English modern term we use for Patanjali's um, word for it in Sanskrit, anavasti tattvani, or um, alabda bhumikattva, he says sometimes. These two kinds of spiritual impediments. So uh, if you're looking as a karma, just as an evil effect that happened and it's over and done with, uh, you're probably not seeing the full picture yet. Uh, residues of karmas are stored in, they affect the nadis. I was talking to a medical practitioner the other day, who's a holistic healer, and he said, oh yeah, by the time you're our age, Babaji, 60, 70, uh, your nadis are like the pipes of a house. They've got so much water has run through them of different kinds and so many liquids that they've, they've got uh, covered, covering on the inside of each nerve. And uh, so it's, uh, about 50% less of the 
amount of energy or liquid or whatever it is flowing through your nerves and your physical nerves of course he's talking about are being impeded and slowed down so that's called aging oh, and so forth gives rise to disease so eating good foods and juicing and making sure that uh, your food is blessed with mantra before you take it in and getting good exercise all these things on the physical le level are actually just in the realm of physical karma and they'll cause a residue uh, the greatest storage of karma is in the mind of course because our lifetimes come out of our karmas so whatever lifetime we're living in whatever body whatever shape the body is in is only a part of it but what you're really think, looking at as you look at a person or if you look at yourself in the mirror is your past lifetimes and how they formed your features the same with animals how did they get their animal body insects and so forth it all has to do with openings nerves channels flow of energy like prana or lack thereof or impedance of flow, flow or expansion of flow like uh, uh, may our bodies experience great health may our life force flow unimpeded may our minds expand in their capacity to know Brahman that's one of the peace chants apyayantu mamangani vak pranas chakshu shrota matra balamindriyani are all of our senses cha sarvani so basically they're talking about this uh, allowance of of na all natural flow to be flowing through all your nadis so the last one they mentioned is may our mind expand in its capacity to know Brahman so with that being the case then we know that there are subtle nerves by the hundreds and thousands in our subtle body which is in our mind not in our brain there are not that many nerves in the brain but in the mind there are hundreds and thousands it's a net network and they're not on, on the physical level and this is what people are not understanding and not seeing because they can't see them with the physical eyes under a microscope after a scalpel has done its business this is all inner life inner world so it's all inner flow or lack of inner flow if you don't have an eternal life as Jesus said they had plenty of prana flowing on the outside with with wives and huts and fishes and nets uh, but you didn't have an uh, eternal life yet so you had to go out and find this eternal life it means go in to find this eternal life and open up these nadis good good name in both Vedanta and yoga and in Kundalini yoga so that this flow can be unimpeded may it flow unimpeded body energy and mind and I, I added in there emotions psychological and spiritual too and also intellectual or philosophical all these are very powerful ways and there are also places where karmas tend to jam up in, inside of a channel like a dam in a river uh, or some kind of impedance that's not letting the flow go through as usual so that's what we mean about destroying karmas with mantra in today's day and age they give us the mantra because if there is such a thing as a quick fix that's it for people who are seeking God and they're sincere about it and they also see the world around them as a mirage come friend the world is but a mirage and you need to go to the river of Ramakrishna and bathe a beautiful song I was singing today in the morning uh, the river of Ramakrishna is a great tributary rolling to the ocean of formless awareness and these are mantras these are slokas these are words but the reason I'm, I'm bringing it up is because people don't have access to time today because of work duties and distractions too uh, that are impeding the flow of all of these realizations call them insights for now so they they need something that will get to the root of matter and that's mantra uh, also I'd say mantra and slokas because they're both very much the same thing sometimes the words are used interchangeably we usually think of mantra as just one hopefully one and not a whole bunch of them necessarily you're practicing one at a time to dig one deep well to get to realization of reality and so that could be your 
your mantra given to you by your initiatory guru, like taking refuge uh, with the Sufis, or taking uh, taking hand with the Sufis, or taking refuge with the Buddhists, or getting mantra diksha with the Hindus, with with the yogis, and so forth. Uh, all of these are commitments or deeper commitments to cutting out more time to be able to spend in practice so that these, as Buddha called them, dharma drops will fill the bucket of your intended practice and you'll have a great store of them. We were talking about the uh, elephant getting its bath late at night uh, just before the sun goes down. The elephant driver gives it the bath, puts it in the stall so that it will come out in the morning fresh and clean because if he gives the bath too early it just rolls in the dust and it's dirty all day. And uh, so that means Sri Ramakrishna's story that you you study all your life, you, you do deep practices. In this time that you do have, mantra would be the one that's the most powerful and effective and the swiftest because the other ones you would do would be deep contemplation, memorization, and recitation of the slokas or of the sutras of, of the different scriptures. Another one would be meditating after this great input of insight from the illumined souls has entered in through the channels in, of your ears into the subtle ears, into your mind. And then, then all of a sudden it's in there, you've got it, it's causing you to remember certain things. You're having certain flashes of insight. Now you sit with those insights. You just watch the mind because it'll, it'll render it silent. So it's a way of saying how, destroy, how karmas get destroyed. You can't actually see it when it's so subtle. And sometimes you can't feel the karmas going away. You have to wait and do months of practice. And then all of a sudden look back and say, I don't have that weight anymore. What happened? Well, most people forget that it's because they did practice for months they all of a sudden say thank you god or you know isn't god grace great or, or isn't the grace has come upon me but it was this practice that was mated with grace that caused this openness and you didn't actually see the karmas go away because just like you don't see the the uh, terrain go by on a train trip it's just all of a sudden you're at your destination so this is how Holy Mother explained it. And uh, she's really part of the subject. Uh, she's really at the core. So um, this is a quick definition or explanation of, of how karmas get destroyed by mantra. It's given to us to have a mantra. We repeat it many times, hopefully with deep intensity, with full attention, with full consciousness on it for a matter of 20 minutes, a half hour, two hours, couple times a day, maybe uh, early morning and late at night before sleep. Uh, and this opens up these nadis and channels. You feel much better, so you know they're open. You're, you're living a dharmic life and everything is flowing well. And karma is coming back at you or coming at, back quickly rather than slowly, as, as Vivekananda mentioned that, the karmas of a more advanced spiritual person come back swift. So they do something, an action that was not uh, in full consciousness or was inadvertent, inadvertently done. And all of a sudden that day, they see some effect from it. Say, oh, I see, I did that, it happened like that. And the same with good actions. But for people who don't have that kind of understanding, it'll take a long time for effects to come back from actions. And they'll be confused by that. They don't know where the source is that it was coming from. So they'll blame it on something else other than their own actions. Blame it on God, blame it on whatever. But Holy Mother said, God is not responsible for good and bad actions. That's your doing. So what God does do for us through its divine Shakti is give us these mantras and these teachings, these great slokas, including the words I'm saying right now in the Dharma around Atmagyan, in the Vedanta and in the Tantra, so that we can work these things out as they rise and then maybe reach a place where we're oblivious to the accumulation of karma. You have what they call in the scriptures colorless karma, neither black or white nor gray or black and white, 
but it's colorless. You're acting without acting. And uh, those are, of course, great teachings that lean more toward Advaita Vedanta or the highest teachings of non-duality. So since we're talking about Shakti then, let's go ahead and look at a chart or two in the remaining time so that this becomes more, uh, gives us more clarity. And we will have two more hours, that is next Sunday and the following Sunday to continue on with what we don't necessarily complete today. When you're talking about the divine Shakti and practice of mantra, then uh, the great souls have determined that it's in 21 steps or 21 points that mantra has its effect on your karma. So you can see there, uh, that's a beautiful collection of malas back there that I took a picture of in India when I was at a shop. And uh, different uh, rajaksha ones there and ivory and, and uh, or uh, bone, sometimes, sometimes they're even made of bone. So basically, you can see that the mala is very important. And you can look at a chart maybe next week about uh, the meaning of the 108 seeds on your mala. Each one of those is a different deity and is connected inward to that deity by a word or a name or a mantra. Uh, so you see the outer bead, the outer set of beads has 108, which is an auspicious number. The guru bead is at top. And then that signifies Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. And the holes in the beads signify, the thread that goes through the holes of the beads signify. And uh, we'll maybe look at that next week. But for now, just imagine that each bead also is connected to a deity that can destroy karmas if you connect it that way. So that's why they don't want you just to say the mantra like a parrot. You know the famous story in, in the Gospel from Krishna, just say it like a parrot. Or say the slokas just like a parrot. Or sing a song just like a parrot. Because if we're going to talk about the, the goddess Sharada, Sharada, which is her birthday just passed, as the goddess of wisdom, then we'd want to sing to her that way too. Om Sharada, Om Sharada, Jai Sri Ramakrishna, Om Sharada, Om Sharada, Om Sharada, Jai Sri Ramakrishna, Om Sharada, Jai Swami Vivekananda, Jai Sri Raka, Turyananda Yogananda, Om Kaima. Om Sharada, Om Sharada, Jai Sri Ramakrishna, Om Sharada, Om Sharada, Om Sharada, Jai Sri Ramakrishna, Om Sharada, Jai Sri Ramakrishna, Om Sharada, Jai Sri Ramakrishna, Om Sharada. Along with several other verses that mention uh, Sharadananda, Shivananda, Subodhananda, Vigyanananda, Advaitananda and so forth, Vigyanananda, all the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, all around Holy Mother. So this next chart shows you a picture of her. And this is, in this day and age, the storehouse of Shakti power out of which these great mantras are coming. You, and you must chant them then with knowledge of the deities. Isn't it true? I just did that every time I sing something or say a mantra or read a scripture. Those are holy utterances realized and they have connected to them deep wisdom that will destroy karma and you have to then connect them also to the holy names that's what a mantra is like om namah shivaya you've got the om what to say about that 
lots. I'll have to wait for another class series or retreat for that. Uh, so, and then Namah Shivaya, you know, the name of Shiva, and Shiva himself as the deity and what he signifies. So this is all destroying the karmic, uh, the ill-considered karmas or actions that people have done by putting the name with the form of Lord Shiva, who is the greatest of all destroyers. So there we have uh, the rationale to it, if you need any. Um, so as you see this chart here, let's look at it quickly so that we can show you this 21 point of mantra practice in four phases. So when you do the mantra, it might be helpful to know that when you take up a mantra, there are four aspects of Shakti who are presiding over that at, at four different stages. And I'll show you a chart on that too, so that you can make these connections deeply. The, the stages themselves are called Vaikari, Madhyama, Para and Pashanti, or Pashanti and Para, if you want to go in order. So basically, let's see, let's hear a brief description by the masters of the art of mantra about these four stages. Vaikari is the fourth stage, that is the, the, the grossest stage. If you're working from outside in, it rep represents the articulate form of sound at which stage the mantra charges and purifies the mind, revealing the presence of the antaryami. The antaryami is the inner, uh, the inner ideal seated in your heart, the inner ruler immortal seated in the heart, I've heard it said as. So imagine the power of getting a mantra from a realized soul, that being just the first stage of it, going from outside in. So it, that form of sound, which is gross sound, uh, gross sound meaning said with physical tongue, heard through physical ears, those are the nadis that it's passing through. But if you trace it back, it's going back, of course, to the mind and to the words themselves. The sound Brahman is then perceived. One's awareness intensifies. The breathing stills, Kundalini rises, and inner visions occur. <laughs> probably not a lot of us can say, well, that happened to me right when I got my mantra. It probably takes some time. But there are people who uh, have done mantra in previous lifetimes who, as soon as they're given the mantra, go into a deep state. Upanishads describe them. Oh, I heard a kettle drum sound like a tinkling of a bell. I heard the sound of a flute. Uh, they're even described in the Upanishads sometimes that you have these inner experiences right off the bat. So the mantra is already doing its purificatory work. The next phase, Madhyama, at that stage, which acts as an intermediary between the, the fourth and the second, Vaikari and Pashanti, represents the third and slightly gross form of sound. So it's more refined form of sound taking inside. Here the seeker perceives the interior realms, but remains clear of them accesses occult powers yet resists using them and feels bliss but rises above it. So this is the seeker who is guided by an adept guru in the practice of mantra, be, is very careful of feelings of bliss, of powers that come their way, and uh, also um, observing these inner realms, these kingdom of heavens within you, observing them when they appear inside of you because that's where they are. So it's sometimes quite a shock to people to know that all of this lies within. The kingdoms of heaven lie within. My father's mansion has many rooms or my father's castle has many mansions. However you want to say that, this is all indicative of these inner realms inside that are opened up by a mere word out here. So that's, a, that's the signifier out here. And it has stages of its appearance. So now we've looked at the first and second stage. We're going from the outside in as if we received the mantra, like Om Sharada, Om Sharada, Jaya Sri Ramakrishna. Those are both pre-initiatory mantras that I received when I was young. So I put them in a song. Om Sharada, Om Sharada, Jaya Sri Ramakrishna, Om Sharada. So the, if you say anyone's name, they'll look at you 
It's the same if you say their name intense, intensif, intensely enough inside, they will look at you. Their attention will come upon you. And then this is where insights and realizations come from. Straight from the Divine Mother of the Universe and her grace. Call it grace if you want, but you had to raise your sail to catch that wind of grace, didn't you? So mantras working swiftly and quickly in that way. Let's look at the third stage in our brief class here where we're, we're quintessentializing all these teachings down into one hour. So Pajanti is next. Pajanti represents the subtle and second stage of sound. Om, perceived earlier, now turns to light or jyoti. An indrawn state of witness is prevalent there and the soul experiences pure awareness beyond bliss. Pashanti Vak is divine vision. The supreme speech of the Vak Devi. Vak means word, the goddess of the word. It's unmanifested and full of spirit. The seers and gods use it for envisioning everything. Pervading all, it extends from Muladhara up to Saraswara. So you can see how uh, intense it is as the word reaches itself back to its source. And of course, we're looking at this from outside in. If you went furthest in, then para would become the initial stage. It's actually the final stage when you're using a mantra to affect realization. Mantra yoga, it's called. So to describe para, which means supreme, the initial state beyond images, I'm sorry, the initial state beyond stages, but it is beyond images too, para represents the primordial hub of potentiality and divine emanation and expression, including worlds, beings, words, and their fractions, manifest as atomic centers of consciousness. Para is the unity existing in all diversity directly realizable through the awakening and upward ascent of Kundalini Shakti. Shiva, Chit Shakti, and Prana Shakti are all associated with the Paravak. So these are why you're going to need to make an introduction to these deities within you. It's called deity yoga. So it, it can't be left aside and then hope to get to non-duality by jumping the gods and goddesses uh, or so easily going beyond the ancestors or transcending the Trinity. These are all great tasks, actually great victories, as we will see in one of our other charts. The seven victories are in Tantra are, are granted by this kind of an ascension, inward ascension, we call it. So the quote down here by the mother, she says, I gave you initiation because you show signs of being a noble soul. See that you do not betray me. You are perfectly satisfied if you get the mantra, but you never think of the consequence. The consequence means here, you never used the mantra after she gave it to you. So then you're expecting karmas to be alleviated and it doesn't happen that way. The other consequence is, is if you use the mantra, you've taken on a great responsibility for your own spiritual life and you need to keep it up. So it goes both ways. It cuts both ways, this sword of wisdom in, in mantra yoga. Uh, that's where uh, further explication can be gotten by going to the guru. Now let's look at the top quote to finish this chart. All the alphabets and their corresponding fractions and the mantras comprised of them are all intrinsically connected with the self. Due to the influence of nations, Maya Shakti covers their true meaning and function and the eternal self takes on a sense of individuality and assumes atomic proportions. That's called sense of individuality, ego, body mechanism, atomic proportions, matter. Recitation of the mantra wakens the power inherent in the word and restores meaning, thus wisdom. So if you lost the meaning of your life because you took on a body and you came to the earth full of material objects, you got attached to them, you forgot yourself. It's really that simple. Now, it's also simple to regain it. Remember the self. Best of all, if you remember the mother, that's why I chanted at the top of this class, 
they thought about and came to know the divine Shakti, the imperishable Shakti, uh, by meditating upon her. Te dhyan yoga nugato pashan devatma shaktim svagunayar nagudam. She's covered by the gunas, uh, but you can, uh, and she's covered herself by that, but, but she gives you the mantra by which to lift off those coverings so you can see her. And she can operate inside of these centers called chakras in Kundalini Yoga. We'll look a little bit at that soon. Let's shift to the next chart so that we get uh, the first part of these three classes done in an hour each. The next, uh, but those are, uh, of course, if I were, if I had more power, more time, I would be explaining those with other charts. Um, but that's enough to have down on recording so people can look back on this and uh, go forward with their spiritual practice. Now back to the chart with the malas in the picture in the centerpiece. There is 21 points to the mantra practice, but don't forget this because what we just did, this previous chart, was look at the descriptions of how these 21 points happen in four phases. Those four phases are here listed on this chart, starting down the left, across the bottom, up the right. There are 20, 21 points of mantra practice beautifully put down for anyone who wants to know. And uh, in, the, in the tradition of, of uh, Kundalini Yoga and Mantra Yoga, which is basically leaning more towards a tantric, very associated with Vedic, but leaning more towards a tantric rendering. So let's look, we can see here if that Vaikari stage we read we read about it's the fourth stage it charges and purifies the mind it connects you with the antaryami uh, it intensifies your awareness your breathing can come to a stillness and uh, inner visions occur i'm reading this back to you because you're not seeing that chart uh, yet because it's probably being replaced on your screen by this chart so i'll read it back to you in a synopsis that's what we just read as its description. Let's see how they put it point by point. First of all, receive a mantra from a guru. <laughs> it's not going to work or work very well if you don't. So I hear that a lot from people. I got a mantra from a book and it didn't seem to work. Or can I get a mantra from a book? Well, there are, if you count slokas, there are hundreds and thousands of mantras in each book because each sloka is kind of a mantra because it has some sort of connection to some aspect of wisdom like Shiva or Vishnu or Brahma or a great Rishi like Pipalada or Yagi Valkya. Um, there are so many ways in which these names of great souls are associated with mantras that they've used to get their illumination and those have come down to us as scripture. So they're seeing the whole thing as pregnant with Shakti power, the Vak Devi. It's all infilled with the wisdom mother. That's what gives meaning to a word. Have you ever thought of it? Gee, what's that meaning word? Uh, what's that uh, word mean? <laughs> See, what's that word mean? I mean? Never one asks, what's the meaning in that word? See, they always ask, what's that word mean? And then it goes right by them that the actual meaning in the word is the mother. So she's that swift and that, that quick. She outstrips all that runs, the scriptures say, the Upanishads. The Chitti Shakti, father of yoga, called her. So receive a mantra from a guru, because that guru uh, should uh, know what it means, should be able to transmit it to you. I'm not talking about spiritual marketeering where they're selling mantras and they're not telling you what the meaning is and they're not giving you a practice around it. They're not telling you what Om in your mantra means, for instance. There's a meaning to A-U-M that is usually the first word of your mantra if it's a mantra that's in Tibet, India, or uh, yoga and so forth. It's always usually starts out with that key bijam to Brahman called Om. You have to know this and they have to teach you this. And so receive a mantra from an authentic guru. If I had had more room there, I could have written that. This is still at the Vaikari stage from the outside in. Then it animates the chitta. The chitta is your thoughts, basically, are your thoughts. 
And so some people's thoughts are very sluggish and slow, right? Or sometimes even your thoughts may be slow in the morning. Uh, I must do get my coffee. But no, you actually have to go get your kali. It's what you need to do and get that chitta animated because you don't need any intoxicants or substances if you uh, have Shakti in you. So you invoke her first. That's why you get up in the morning, invoke the Divine Mother wisdom, pranam to her, ask her to awaken your consciousness. And these are words you're relating to her and she's in those words. So remember you connect yourself to her and the connecting point, as just said, the intermediary point is that profound mantra you got from a teacher or those great slokas that you're memorizing, Swadhyaya style in yoga, in, in the Yoga Sutras. Uh, so that's all very important. Uh, animate the chitta then, wake up your thoughts, then awaken mind to the Antaryami, the inner ruler, immortal, sealed into your heart. So this is already there before you even find a mantra in a guru. This is your inner self. This is your Atman. This is your Buddha nature. This is your Busho. This is pure conscious awareness, but it happens to be associated with a specific kind of form. It's God with form, Sarupa, and Salokya, and Sayuja, and Samipya. It's called in four different ways, it's associated with a form. So make sure you see that form. That is your own true nature, your Antaryama. Antaryami. Antar means inner. Then after you do these, anahata sound is detected. Anahata is, means actually Brahman. It's the sound, the anahata dvani, it's sometimes called. It's the actual sound uh, itself. And right now it has, for you fortunately, both a gross and a beginning to become subtle form. So you have to say it out into the atmosphere and hear it. Jai Shri Rama Krishna, Om Shri Sharda, Om Namah Shivaya. And then not just let it go out there, its vibration and dissipate somewhere, but know that it came from a source and that you're very, very fortunate to have an exterior sound that can affect others like the guru to the disciple and can also affect yourself when you hear yourself say it. But it also has an inner meaning and that's leaning more towards this second stage. That Anahata sound is detected as the buzzing of thousands of bumblebees. If you've ever been behind uh, nearby a, a tree full of bees and you just sit there for a while and it's just this deep hum. Sometimes they describe it like that. And it, uh, it's just like the light it happens sometimes, like the sound of a deep kettle drum booming in the distance. That sound will also happen. That's very much connected to mantra. Sight and sound are, are, are two very powerful indicators for the presence of intelligence or their presence of consciousness. Jyoti and Shabda, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. The fifth is thoughts begin to dissolve. This is remember a point by point that happens to you when you get a mantra from an aesthetic teacher and begin to use it and keep it up. See my seminar in two weeks and we'll talk about that. Um, uh, how to follow through with these practices so that you just just hear them all of a sudden and walk walk away and not realize them like you got out you arrived at the sands the beach you heard a distant sound boy that's amazing i wonder what that is and then you walk away so you never see the ocean behind all those sand dunes because you never took the time to walk and trudge across the ground across those sands so that's what happens to people who Betray me. You see, I gave you the mantra because I thought you were a noble soul. Maybe you fooled her and you weren't such a noble soul. I've had that happen to me, I can tell you. And then you walked away you know, and, and betrayed this great trust of getting a mantra from an illumined soul. What to speak of from the Divine Mother of the Universe, my God. So uh, all of this around uh, this importance of, of the first stage of a fourfold stages of 21 points of mantra practice. There you have it, thoughts dissolve. So, boy, you've been, what, going to this religion and that path and this guru, and they've all been telling you, quit thinking, and you've never achieved it. 
here you are. It happens as a matter of course early on when you use the mantra given to you by an illumined soul. Six, intensification of awareness happens. So what had to get out of the way in order, in order for you to have this intensification, intensification of your own vibration, your own sacred vibration humming in there? You couldn't hear it. It was that voice in the distance that they talk about. Uh, a voice in the wilderness, a beautiful piece of music I used to play on the cello named that, voice in the wilderness. So that's what you're, you're beginning to see in this, what right now, because you haven't come upon the locus yet, right? Because it'll, re it'll reveal to you certain words. What happens right now is you're just beginning to hear the sound of those worlds. They each have a vibration, a chakra, if you wish. And uh, there are many of them clustered around one particular inner atmosphere, inner location. Seven, breath becomes equalized. So what, you've gone and you've done your hatha yoga asanas and they told you to huff and puff your lungs and it never worked for you or you got dizzy and thought you had samadhi. What nonsense. Here's how to actually neutralize the breath. You take the mantra in, follow the tradition, go step by step, your thoughts dissolve and you stop breathing. It's just like going to sleep at night. Do you think when you go into sleep tonight, gee, I'm gonna stop breathing now. It just happens to you in deep sleep, it's called. So you need to do this consciously. You need to breathe until vibrations of your mind stop. Well, this happens in the other way. Vibrations of the mind stop called thoughts. The intense level of your consciousness emerges out of that, like an ocean after a storm, no waves. And then there is this beautiful light of consciousness or the, the beautiful sound, distant sound of the, the primal unstruck sound of the word. Kundalini rises then. That's where she's awakening and rising. And if you want to look at this in another chart, this all has to do up to this point with the first three chakras. There's another chart I'll show you next week. Be on hand for it. So you get this full mantra transmission and how it destroys karmas, either immediately or over time, that basically you're, this is what's going to happen when these, the four aspects of Shakti awaken at four different levels of your chakras. The first three, the second two, the third, and the last. We'll see that soon. So she's beginning to rise here is the point. She hears and sees Shiva at the crown chakra. So she's on her way. You better cling to her skirts, you see. So you can take that ride with her. The ninth and final stage, uh, or final point we should, we should say, of this first stage of Vaikari, is sounds and visions start to occur. And that's where she says here, you know, be careful not to get off base with occult powers, visions of worlds, and uh, and uh, and uh, feelings of early bliss. That's why Father of Yoga said there are four impediments, right, to your meditation. One of them is bliss. So the, you'll get this early sound, early sight. You say, "Well, I arrived at the third eye, didn't I?" No. Your consciousness just got a glimpse of that because she was rising. She gave you an early experience of a third eye opening. It doesn't mean that you're there uh, because if you're there, the worlds wouldn't be here still. Your body wouldn't be around you. You'd be in a transcendental state because the worlds all go away at that high level. So you, you're moving through them now. And that's how you get past the ancestor realm so you won't be reborn again here. And that's how you get beyond the gods because the gods are actually your servants, you're not theirs. And that's how you get to the Trinity and beyond to the word. This is all an inward ascension that's very important. And it's a, a journey that's been taken by hundreds and thousands of souls, particularly in India. They've left behind a great record of it. So that's the first stage and uh, we've accomplished it in, in enough time to get into the second stage, which is called, remember, um, Madhyama. 
So Madhyama to remind you, uh, slightly gross form of sound persists. Uh, one perceives these inner worlds, but remains clear of them. Occult powers start to come, but uh, resists them because you know it's a, it's a deterrent, it's a distraction. And then bliss starts to happen and the guru tells you, hold on there, don't lose yourself yet. There's more karmas to come that will ruin your bliss later if you don't take care of it now. So this is all point by point. How does that happen? Because there's only four stages in the Madhyama stage, four points. Perception of inner realms, so you're actually beginning to see those kingdoms of heaven within you because they don't just start to exist when you when you die and cease to exist when you're born. They're always there. And many people are coming out of them to take a body through the ancestors. Uh, and so these inner realms have to be espied. Oh, I see all the worlds are within me. All knowledge lies within me. The deities all within me. All these sacred slokas have come from within me. My family, the great souls all within me. See, I am that, I am that is where you're headed when you have this view of inner Prakriti and uh, how Divine Mother is conducting and overseeing all the realms of the Devas and Devis and the ancestors and the celestials and the angels and the demigods and the Asuras and so forth and so on. So then after that, what happens across the bottom, the Nadis uh, are clearly heard. I'm sorry, the nada is clearly heard. So that's nada is another sound word for anahata. That's, that's the sound, it's flow of shakti is putting off, like bees are putting off that humming sound. So the shabda brahma, the anahata, the nada, those are all words that are fairly synonymous with one another that have to do with this divine sound. So that becomes to, becomes to become prevalent over the light. Even people who are having inner visions will first probably hear these deep inner sounds. Those ones that are having visions are, are visionaries. Their, their consciousness is more visionary. The ones that are proceeding to the word, in the beginning was the word, are mystics basically. And so they're hearing and the others are seeing visuals and, and uh, audibles on an inner, le inner level. The next point, uh, oh, there are more than four. There were actually five here. So the third point in this stage is called awareness focuses on Om. So here's a very profound juncture inside of the whole 21 points is where mm, that is such an attracting sound, like the sound of an ocean in the distance again, that those who are absolutely adamant about reaching the ocean of formlessness will know that the source of all awareness is there, that all the great souls have come out of that and merged back into it. All the worlds and all the beings in the worlds have come out of that word and merged back into it. And um, there's where uh, they want to make a swift retreat from lower realms and merge themselves in that highest source. Then the next point after focusing on Om is resistance to inner worlds. So that's where in the Madhyama phase, the mother has told us about that. Be careful of, of getting um, um, pulled into these inner worlds as if they were the ultimate gain. That's what happens to your ancestors. They're born back on earth. So you want to observe these worlds inside of you. You observe Maya, you don't get involved in it. If you do get involved in it, it pulls you deeper in into lifetimes, cycles of lifetimes, as you're called samsara or Maya. So basically you want to um, watch that panorama, that inward panorama just flow by uh, and float over it, as it were, observe it from a distance. And then another thing that will come is these occult powers. You'll want to get down in there and 
muck it up in some cases. In other cases, you want to get down in there and manipulate it. Prakriti Laya style. That is, there are beings who um, can create worlds out of unmanifested Prakriti. That is, thought power. They'll create whole worlds out of it, trap people in it, and preside over them. Those are called lower gods. Krishna mentions them in the Gita. So you want to go beyond these lower gods and go straight to the source. And so you don't want to get attracted to either these worlds themselves or the powers that are there, which are trying to allure you into name and form. Like a birth in a womb on earth. Krishna says there are many kinds of wombs on earth, but there are also many kinds of wombs in these lower heavens. Fourteenth point of this 21, which is the fourth point of the second stage Madhyama, is that aspirant stays detached from bliss. And of course, I mentioned it, this is where you need a teacher and have to be referring to the teacher constantly for years, maybe, so that when these experiences happen to you, because they will have a sort of initial intensity, like was mentioned here, uh, that you have visions early on when you use the mantra, but those will wane. They'll go away after a while and you wonder what happened. The mantra lost its power and maybe the path isn't for me and oh, that guru is not illumined and other such nonsense going on. So basically you have to stay with it for a long time if you have received those precious booms of the triple gem, guru, dharma, sangha. And it all supports itself and they support each other. So um, that's the final of this uh, final point, 15th point of these 21 points. Stay de de detached from the bliss that comes from that and reject the occult powers and resist occupation in the wombs of beings who are inhabiting these inner worlds, these lower heavenly realms. Let's go on to Pishanti. As, uh, I told you it was an hour class, but I've given myself an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, it's usually what we do before we break for our second half. So we'll go a full hour and 15 today so that we get these two ch charts under our belt, in our minds, and we know what mantra really is and, and what it does to karmas and how it does it. In the time you've been listening in this hour, this hour you haven't been accumulating anything but good karmas, for one thing because your mind has been focused on Atmagyan. It's been focused on Dharma. So how about 24 hours focused on Dharma? Or how about a retreat like we had last weekend where three days were focused on Dharma? Even our food was taken dharmically. Those are the kind of things that you want to expand, give time to, and then you'll see karmas go away. They'll just disappear. One day I awoke and my, and my delusion was gone, gone utterly gone. Beautiful song by Rampersad Sen in the Hindu tradition. It woke and my delusion was gone. So all of these things that had been a problem to him were gone one morning because he had been doing his practice for months and months. Maybe thinking along the way, it's not working, it's not working. And all of a sudden, it's gone, it's gone, I'm free. You see? Uh, that's Attribute that to grace, if you will, but without the self-effort to get you there, uh, it doesn't work. So the Pashanti stage here, and I'll, I'll tell you the highlights of it again here, is that uh, it's, this, it's the third stage from outside in. It's the second stage from inside out, is what, what that means here. So it now turns to light. So this is where the sound and the light have a divine relationship inside and where people start to see the light. Departed souls being talked to by Rinpoche's or by, by illumined souls back on earth are telling their devotees after they pass from the body, see the light, see the light, go towards it. The Buddha light, the rainbow body, uh, the Brahma Jyoti, the light of awareness. If you see that, go towards it. Try and attain it. Try to immerse yourself in it because then, of course, uh, all of those karmas will be washed clean. And in the meantime, your mantra is probably going on very intensely inside of that practice while you go into meditation each morning and when you die at the end of your life. 
it's the same transition into another bardo. So if you prepared for it ahead of time, like the elephant in its hut, late at night, all washed clean, you come out all clean in the morning. So whether you're taking another birth or not, or whether you're immersing yourself in the ocean of Brahman, should you be so high and formless, uh, it really amounts to the same thing with the mantra. So um, that's why uh, it's, it's um, beginning to turn to light, you see. And uh, this is where the gods are, uh, in the higher realms are even using it. You know, so, so um, higher realms and worlds, higher uh, chakras are, are being maintained by that light. So sound more towards third chakra, the Anahata chakra is named after Om. So that's your hearing Om there, but you're going to see light at the fourth, fifth chakras. And uh, we'll, we'll look at that next week when I show you the four aspects of Shakti that provide, preside over these four stages, which are using these 21 points. It's all very beautiful mantra yoga science. And it's a, it's a science of practice that, gain, that nets results. So the Pashanti, Pashanti stage here is Nada reveals Jyoti then witness consciousness develops. Sakshi Bhutam, we call that. So you had good practice resisting the worlds in the last phase, right? So you've developed more muscles to stay detached from anything that's happening below or outside of you. So your witness consciousness is getting an injection of Brahmagyan and it decides it's going to stay up in the air in higher atmospheres, like a bird. Oh, should I light there? Oh, there might be danger there. Should I light there? Should I take a drink of water? I think I'm just going to stay up here in the air, you see. So witness consciousness, the soul is just floating, as it were, transcendent of all the worlds and beginning to acclimatize itself to the light of Brahman, the light of consciousness. Wash yourself clean of all karmas, even the most subtle ones. So witness consciousness deserves a whole new chart, which maybe I can show you next week. And finally, experience of pure conscious awareness happens. That's where the real thing happens really for the first time in real time, <laughs> not in time that flows in cycles, but in real time. When we say real time in Vedanta, we mean one second, the eternal moment. It's all happening in the eternal moment. Everything outside of that eternal moment is a play. But when the consciousness reaches that eternal moment, it, it's, it's still. Just like early on it was practicing for that when the mantra stilled its thoughts, right? And consciousness intensified, uh, like Sharon Krishna said, like shooting a gun for the first time. <gasps> You're shocked. It's that moment of shock taken to a spiritual level where everything is in one eternal moment. So that's what's happening here for the first time, the first real time in that soul's lifetime is experiencing pure consciousness and awareness while still in the body. That's not in the body level of consciousness, but the body still remains after that experience. It can be uh, cast away in 21 days like a leaf in a storm, Robert Christian said. Depends on if that's uh, what the soul is uh, working hard for or whether they want to come back into form to help others or to, again, finish up and neutralize the rest of their karmas. That's the Pashanti stage. Very beautiful with its three points, very rich, very explanatory, even with a few words, but why not? Mother's in all those words. The para stage is the final three of these 21 points. The Vak Devi resides in all of that. So you can see why, um, where that's all headed and why we started us, ourselves out acknowledging her, like in a song. What we're talking about here is Shakti. She's destroying the karmas through her power words. They're called bijams. When they're really powerful, 
and then they're called mantras when you take and put the deity's names with them. And that's a lot of power you've got going there, and it's inward power or inner power, and you have to somehow extract it out of things. To use an analogy like science extracted power out of atomic particles when it learned how to split them. In the same way inward, there's this inner power which is not for destruction, but is for benefit. And you have to find these words, meditate on them, and extract that Shakti power and use it for the highest good of all people. That's what my teacher Swami Sheshananda Ji Maharaj used to tell us from the podium. Science has ex exploded the atom and released a great power for destruction, but Sri Ramakrishna came to the world and uh, he split the curtain of Maya and, re and released a great power for spiritual um, perfection and realization. So this is the difference between inner and outer power. The Vak Devi resides there. You'll, you'll see her, as it were, see her and be her, as it were. And then Rishi Hood is attained. So you can see we're having a very high definition of what a Rishi is here. In case you thought it was just someone who wrote some scriptures back some millennia ago, you could see that they are with us for the whole trip, for the whole journey over yugas, from yuga to yuga's end, Sri Krishna says in the Gita. So they're here with us, and they themselves are that very power inside of her words. And they have names that are full of power, like Jesus and Buddha and Krishna, Muhammad. And these are names of power associated with great realized souls who are saying the words of the scriptures and uttering the mantras and chanting the names of the Lord all the time throughout these long cycles of passing time and affecting people by it. See, they're infusing people with, with uh, Divine Mother Wisdom. And the last and 21st st step there as we bring this particular class to an end, everything is seen as mantra at that point. The, the word is everywhere and in everything. And you know that's her word, so it makes it even more powerful. And that's how you get to such great Advaitic realizations as all is Brahman. That thou art. That is, I am that and all, and that is Brahman. Everything is Brahman. Because you're seeing that essence inside of it, and the object has been separated from the essence so that you can see the backdrop, the underlying substratum of it all and let the, S, uh, let the image come dancing back, it too is just vibration from the word. So it's okay with me because I've seen the essence behind it. In fact, I've learned how to penetrate through appearances, which is the great art of accomplished yogis and yoginis. So with that, we have spent an hour on two powerful charts that introduced us to this three-class series with the subject of how mantra destroys karmas. So here we will end, and uh, you'll be able to look back on this class before too long if you want to recall these teachings and spend more time with them, because I went a little bit whirlwind through them. We, we do have, have recorded some of these before, and some of my other classes could be looked back upon. But nonetheless, we'll be meeting next week at this same time on Sunday to show you a few more teachings, including the one of the four aspects of Shaki that provide that preside over the four divisions of mantra practice with their 21 points and show you how this is all integrated and synthesized deep within in the science of mantra yoga that is the best way to destroy Kama in this day and age. So here we will then end with a chant. Om Sato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso ma jyotir gomaya, mitur ma amritam gomaya, abir abir mayeti rudrayate dakshina mukam, tenamam pahi nicham, om shantihi shantihi shantihi. Lead us from darkness to light, from lower truth to higher truth, from the unreal to the real, from the illusion of death to eternal life, reach us through and through. O Lord and Mother of the entire universe, with thy sweet and benign presence, Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. 
ओम हरि ओम हरि ओम जप हरि ओम तत्सत